Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, when President Crusoe asked me to um, be the graduation, graduation speaker, I was obviously very honored. But um, my feelings about this have changed pretty dramatically over the last couple of weeks. And in preparing for this address, um, I found that um, my feelings about being the speaker were becoming very um, deeply moving to me personally. Actually, Steve was off by a year. Um, this graduation actually marks the close of my 30th year with the Department of Environmental Studies. So I've, I've offered a full three decades to Antioch. And, and, and when I started teaching in, in the summer of 1978, uh, I was younger than most of you graduates. And uh, I, I was trained as a research ecologist, but my passion was to teach, but I had no training in it. Um, I came into this university with two years of teaching under my belt and not a lot of uh, skills in that arena. Uh, but luckily I looked at teaching as being very similar to a, a process of natural selection. Um, if I could adapt and the selection pressures brought by my students weren't too extreme, I could keep moving forward. Well, my adaptations were all brought to me by my colleagues, past and present. Um, I really... Um, to those who I've worked with, really uh, I'm, I'm just, um, I guess, honored by that presence because all of the adaptations I've picked up, whether it's different, par I mean, different paradigms, different worldviews, um, different sort of pedagogical, uh, you know, sort of means and approaches to education, I've gained them all from my colleagues. And then I've applied them in my teaching, and the students have been the selection pressure. If something didn't work, it was quickly culled out. If it did, it was maintained. If it was marginal, they would tweak it. Um, so what I brought to this was, I think, a passion to teach and an openness to pick up what people were giving back to me. But who I am today as an educator has been completely molded by my colleagues and my students. So anyone that has me in class, you're getting that combined wisdom of everyone I've worked with in this amazing learning community. And, and that realization, which I came to pretty strong in the last two weeks, is a very humbling sort of thing. We often, as faculty, talk about what a transformative experience this is for students. And I've realized that personally, being in this Antioch learning community has been incredibly transformative to me. Whatever stature I have as an educator, or a thinker, or a writer, is directly because of what I have gotten here at Antioch as a member of this faculty, and I'm deeply appreciative. Um, and also, thinking about the past 30 years, I started reflecting back on what's happened in the environmental arena in the last 30 years. In 1978, it was a very heady time to be an environmentalist. At that time, anyone running for political office had to run with a strong environmental platform. Even for the United States House and Senate, they would not get in unless their platform in the number one or two position was a strong stance in the environment. In the last 30 years, as our knowledge of what we are doing to this planet has grown dramatically, and as our understanding of what we need to do to fix those problems has grown dramatically, and as new technologies have come online that allow us to actually do that, sadly what we have witnessed is global environmental degradation not only increasing, but accelerating. And this has led me to the realization that as environmentalists, and I look at all the graduates sitting down here to my left, that our role today is pretty much a role of holding the line. The floodwaters are rising, we are filling sandbags, and we're lifting them higher and higher and higher. And this is incredibly noble work, because if we didn't do it, the flood would have overtaken us already. But all those activities will not change those flood levels rising. And what I've come to realize is that not only as environmentalists, but as all of us, we have got to dramatically change the cultural values of this country and the cultural values of this country is spread around the world. Uh, unless we change cultural values at a very deep level, we will continue to fight the same fights. And so in thinking about this, what I've realized is that we really, what we have to do is we have to change our cultural story. You see, the story that a culture embraces dramatically influences the behavior of its peoples. If you have a story about racial supremacy and scapegoating, you're going to get something like Nazi Germany. Cultural stories have power. And I 
contend that our current cultural story runs absolutely contrary to serious environmental stewardship and a serious change for social justice. And I believe we need to dramatically transform this story. Now, I ask if you look at it critically, you'll see that our present cultural story, a story that is constantly reinforced through advertising, through the media, through the entertainment industry, and also through our political leaders, is a story that is focused on the importance of the individual and the need to consume. And I contend that story is a story that is going to create a self-absorbed populace. And a populace is not going to be able to make the sorts of dramatic change we really need. This story is reinforced by the slogan, have it your way. Verizon will give you the world. The whole thing, just for you, that's quite imagined. Imagine you the whole world. I mean, it's so, it's so insidious, it's even actually come into Antioch. Our portal for online registration is my Antioch. Now, to all my um, wonderful colleagues sitting behind me and to graduates sitting in front of me, you are all very deserving people, but I just have to say, it's really mine. It's my Antioch. You know, it's not really yours, it's mine. Now, as I mentioned, this notion has even gotten into political speak. It used to be that our leaders would address us as citizens. This legislation will be good for the citizens of this country. Listen closely, you'll hardly ever hear that word anymore. It has been replaced. You are much more likely to hear today, this legislation will be good for the consumer. There it is in a nutshell, right there. Now, last week, President Bush gave a speech. I just want to repeat one statement he made from that speech. His statement was, the problem, and I want to emphasize the, not a problem, but the problem with America today is that individuals are not consuming enough. <laughs> if that is our major problem, it's really a striking uh, fact to me. Uh, consumption has become such an icon of this culture uh, just as we might say that the High Holy Days of the Christian faith are ushered in with Good Friday, we could now say that the High Holy Days of Consumption come the day after Thanksgiving with Black Friday. Now, interestingly enough, this cultural story emphasizing individual consumption is not the founding story this country was brought up underneath. Our founding story is embraced in the first three words of the United States Constitution. We, the people. We, the people, not we, the consumer, we, the people. Now, I must contend, when those words were penned, they were terribly flawed. At that time, we, the people, meant white, adult, landowning males. That was it. But, given the context of its time, it was an incredibly bold and visionary idea to take the political power that would be invested in the hands of a monarch or religious figurehead and disperse that among citizens was a radical, radical thing. Now, to give you an idea of how much that cultural story has changed, we only need to look at the state motto of New Hampshire, live free or die. I'm asking a question, I'm asking a question in just a minute. I want to see how many hands are raised by this. But when you first heard that motto, everyone in the audience here and all my colleagues behind me, when you first heard that motto, raise your hand if you thought it was a little bit strange and you chuckled to yourself. <laughs> all right, so I'm seeing about half of the members of the audience. Now, the reason I think that that occurs to us as being somewhat strange is we interpret that under our crucial, current cultural story of a story based on the importance of the individual. We think live free or die is talking about freedom for the individual. Taken to its extreme, that statement is almost like a young child having a temper tantrum. I'm going to do what I want or I'll kill myself. That'll show you. <laughs> but yet, when those words were first spoken by Revolutionary War General John Stark, he was not talking about individual freedom. He was talking about freedom for the people. That's what it was worth sacrificing life for. Freedom for the people. That's how much we have lost that notion in the state motto of New Hampshire that we interpret today as freedom of the individual. Now, the question is, oh, and I should mention, another very important part of that early cultural story was frugality. As a matter of fact, I don't even know when the last time I heard the word frugal was. It seems to have been lost from the American lexicon. But being frugal was considered a civic responsibility when this nation was founded. Take only what you need so that we may share the bounty of this land with all of the citizens. 